Okay, hello, um, all of my exchange students, and um, there are several Japanese students in this class too, so I will speak very um, clearly and slowly so that everybody understands. Um, today's um, assignment is by Joey, the poet, um, a poem by the poet, by Joey, called A Song of Unending Sorrow. In Chinese, it's Chang Heng Ge. And in the Japanese pronunciation is Chogonki, Chogonka, Chogonka. Uh, and um, let's see, this is an introduction to Japanese literature class. So you might be wondering, why am I teaching a um, poem from the Tang Dynasty in China? And the reason is, um, it has been said by uh, numerous scholars that this poem is the foundation of all of Japanese, or at least must, much of Japanese literature. And um, on the study guide, I sort of explain this. At the very bottom, I give a list of all the works that were influenced by this poem and by this story of Yang Guifei. And um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about that, and I'm going to explain your assignment in this short video. So yes, the main characters in this poem by by Joey. By Joey didn't come up with this poem. The story, the legend already existed, and he borrowed um, the elements from this well-known uh, story. Um, the main characters actually existed, and the main female character is Yang Guifei. Japanese say Yokihi. And um, her real name was Yang Yu Huang. She was a renowned beauty of Chinese hit from Chinese history, born of low birth. And uh, she sort of was plucked out by the emperor, Emperor Xuanzong's uh, son. She married his son. And she um, later became a Taoist nun, taking the name Tai Jiang. And in the poem, of course, uh, she becomes a Taoist nun and takes the name Tai Jiang after she dies, after she's executed by the emperor's uh, uh, military sort of advisors. Um, but yeah, she's plucked out by the emperor. She becomes his favored concubine. And the word in Chinese for f favored concubine is uh, Guifei. So her name is Yang Guifei. Yang's her family name. And she becomes the favored concubine of Emperor Xuan Song. And uh, she adopts General An Lu Shang as her son. This is an important name. I'll explain it below. An Lu Shan, of course, is the same An Lu Shan as... Um, the military general of the great An Lushan rebellion and uh, war that uh, war one of the great um, wars in Chinese history, the An Lushan War, and uh, Yang Guifei is blamed by the Imperial Guard for the um, An Lushan rebellion and executed. And by the way, there's a lot of um, other videos about the An Lushan rebellion. There's a famous BBC radio show that spends a whole episode on the rebellion. So if you're interested in this rebellion, this war as a historical um, incident, you might want to listen to that. Um, so next we have Emperor Xuanzong of Tang Dynasty. And again, for those of you who don't know Tang Dynasty, um, I'll explain it below, but Tang Dynasty is one of the um, great eras of Chinese history and it's known for its sort of flourishing of uh, literary arts and um, of culture in general. And the emperor, Emperor Xuanzong of Tang Dynasty, was a wise, enlightened emperor. In his later years, he became more and more interested in art, music, and love, and specifically Yang Guifei, than in governing the realm. And this is sort of read in uh, Chinese, throughout Chinese history, this story is read as sort of a warning to would-be or future um, rulers about... Um, shirking the duties of uh, government. Um, he's also known as Emperor Ming of Tang. You don't need to know that. The An Lushang is the a third character. His name doesn't appear in the poem, but he's alluded to uh, right before the execution scene. An Lushang lived from 703 to 757. He's a Chinese general of Persian and Turkish descent. So he came from the west, right? And the, his armies moved in from the west. And he's adopted by consort Yang, by Yang Guifei. He leads a rebellion, proclaims himself emperor, and ruled for a while. I forget the exact number of years, but he ruled for a while until his rebellion was eventually suppressed 
and he was executed by his own son. This is sort of historical information that doesn't appear in the poem, but it's helpful, or indeed necessary, to know this sort of background information when you read it. Um, then there are, in the study guide, there's a few descriptions of some of the minor characters that appear in the poem or alluded to in the poem. The eunuch, the Gao Li Shi, is a powerful eunuch official. The word for eunuch in Chinese is uh, Huang Guang. And uh, you should know something about the eunuch uh, system that existed in Imperial China from... Oh, that's a big thunder. Um, from uh, early Chinese history all through... I think the eunuch system lasted until like 1915 or something. But the sort of high-ranking officials inside of the uh, Imperial Chinese court were often eunuchs. They were castrated to ensure that they wouldn't sleep with the empress and um, start their own lineage and try to take over the... Um, the emperor's position, but um, the eunuch officials are very close to the emperor, and I think in this poem it's alluded to that they're the ones who kind of convince uh, the emperor that he needs to execute Yang, Yang Guifei. And another, okay, that's good. So moving on to some of the key names and terms that appear in this poem, we have, well, of course, the author of the poem, the poet, Bai Zhou who was the great one of the three or four great poets of the Tang Dynasty? He lived from 772 to 846. Um, he is a renowned mid Tang poet. In the Tang Dynasty, he's usually just divided into three stages. Right now, we're dealing with the third. Uh, he was a devout Buddhist too, so there are a lot of Buddhist em- influences and emphases in his uh, poetry, and I think that's partly uh, to account for the huge popularity. That, popularity that this poem had in Japan, too. As I mentioned in the beginning, this poem sort of found it, formed the foundation of Japanese literature, and part of that is because of the strong sort of emphasis on the impermanence of life and uh, other Buddhist themes. So Bai Zhou was exiled to Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang Dynasty of China at the time, and Chang'an is where the emperor lives in the, in the poem that we're reading today. And he was ex- exiled to Chang'an in 18, 815 for criticism of the government. And he promoted a style of poetry called Yuefu. Yuefu. You don't need to know that much about that, though. Um, Tang Dynasty is the great uh, culture, uh, dynasty of Chinese history that experienced um, a flourishing in poetry and culture and whatnot, as I mentioned. Uh, it began in 618 and lasted to 907. So, um, and some of you may know a little bit about ja- Japanese history, the Heian period, based, uh, <laughs> the Heian period, um, roughly speaking, began in 800 AD and lasted till 1200, right, so 400 years, and the uh, Heian period in Japanese history is greatly, greatly influenced by Tang Dynasty culture, right, so you have Tang Dynasty roughly from 600 to 900 uh, forming sort of the basis of Heian uh, Japanese culture, which starts in 800. Um, so, yes, the Ta- Tang Dynasty is the golden age in the history of Chinese culture, particularly poetry, often divided into four periods. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. I said it was divided into three periods. It's actually four periods, early Tang, high Tang, Tang, mid Tang, and late Tang. Next is Chang'an, is the capital of the Tang Dynasty, as I mentioned. Later, uh, the name of the city was changed to Xi'an, and today I think it's still called Xi'an. Uh, Chengdu is another, some other stuff. The An Lushang Rebellion, in Japanese, it's uh, An Noksan no Dang. Um, some information on your study guide about that. Taoism, right? After the uh, Yang Guifei dies, she goes to this sort of otherworldly heaven kind of place, and um, the emperor sends a Taoist priest to fetch her, right? So Taoism appears in this story. Uh, Dokyo is a word in Japanese. Chinese word is uh, Dao Jiao. Chinese pronunciation, same kanji. Um, Taoism is, of course, the religious and philosophical tradition of ancient China that emphasis, emphasizes living in harmony with the Dao, the Michi, Do. And according to nature, the Ren, uh, Shi Zheng, arose in opposition to Confucianism. And I wrote opposition in your study guide, but it's more like a sort of dialectical um, conversation with Confucianism. So it's always good to think of Taoism and Confu- Confucianism as sort of existing as a pair together. Confucianism lays the um, 
uh, sort of rules for governing society and running for so society and sort of lays down the moral law. Whereas Taoism uh, kind of arises as a response to that. It finds some of the laws of Confucianism somewhat constricting and it sort of um, seeks to... Um, to address some of the more individual or spiritual concerns that uh, people have. So, for example, you have Confucian forming the basis for uh, city urban society, and some people find that that's um, not really fulfilling, so they leave the city, they go into the mountains with some of their sort of erudite uh, literati friends, and they form little Taoist groups that pursue poetry and uh, pleasure and drinking lots of alcohol and whatnot. And those are usually those groups that are usually associated with Taoism. And the two two great uh, texts, foundational texts of Taoism, are of course Lao Tzu's uh, Lao Tzu's uh, Tao Te Ching and Zhuang Tzu's uh, Zhuang Tzu. Right. So um, that's on your study guide. Look at those. And if you have um, opportunity, they've been translated into English numerous times. Uh, read the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuang Tzu to understand what Taoism is. Um, the mountain, Mount Penglai, appears in this poem. It's one of the seven, several legendary mountain islands of Chinese mythology where the eight immortals are said to dwell. And the others are, yeah, I don't need to explain that. It's on your list. Um, uh, two... Let's see, dances appear in this poem, the dance of the rainbow skirt and the feathered dress. I have a little note about that. These are two sort of uh, popular song and dances from Central Asia that were brought to Chang'an via the Silk Road. And of course, the Silk Road is the major sort of highway that connects China of the Tang Dynasty with the West, with Persia and with uh, other kingdoms in the West. And there was a lot of trade and it was sort of the... Um, route by which all the uh, cosmopolitan cities were connected in this ancient world. And, um, so to be, okay, yes, the, uh, the eunuchs, I mentioned the eunuchs, castrated court officials, full castration was required of all male imperial servants. Uh, the pear garden, the li, li yuang, appears in this poem on several instances, you can read the note for that. Another city that appears here is Lu Liu Yang, the eastern capital during the Tang Dynasty, second largest in the world at the time after Chang'an, and as you remember, the after the rebellion of An, Lang, uh, An Lushang, the emperor of this poem uh, flees to this city. Ma Wei Slope is another term you should remember. It appears in the poem. It's the slope west of Chang'an, where Yang Guifei was executed. And the poem is explicitly mentioned in... I'm sorry, the slope is explicitly mentioned in this poem. And finally, at the very end of the poem, we have the seventh day of the seventh month. And this refers to the romantic legend of the cowherd and the weaver girl, represented by the stars Altair and Viga, separated by the Milky Way. The two lovers meet only once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh lunar calendar month, when they cross the heavens on the bridge of magpies. Both the uh, Qixi festival in China and the Tanabata festival in Japan are derived from this legend. So many of you will still be here in Japan during the Tanabata festival in July. So uh, when you celebrate that festival, remember that its origins are um, to be found in this legend. And, well, they precede the legend, but they appear in this legend and in the poem. Okay, now moving on to the study questions. Um, I'm just going to read through the ten questions. You'll need to answer all of these on your uh, homework, uh, in your homework notebook. Um, let me run through them right now. Question number one, how does Bai Zhou the poet, depict Yang Guifei? the heroine, or sort of the main character, female character of the story. What metaphors and similes does he use when describing her? Right? Um, is she a sympathetic character, character? Or is she a conspiring, traitorous enemy of the state? Cite specific passages to support your answer. You might also want to compare this depiction of Yang Guifei with other uh, literary works that, uh, that discuss... That, um, 
depict her, right? And that's at the very end of the study guide, I give a list of all the other works in which she appears. And remember that she's not always a sympathetic character. Sometimes she's uh, depicted as a conspiring, tra traitorous enemy of the state. So the question here is, how is she depicted here? Does Bai Joey, the poet, sympathize with her or not? Give evidence. Uh, number two, discuss the execution scene. Why, how is she executed? Why doesn't the emperor intervene to prevent her death? And this uh, execution scene is very subtly uh, depicted. So uh, on first reading, it might be easy to sort of skip over it. So make sure you, it's only a f three or four lines, I think. Um, so yeah, this question just uh, addresses the execution scene and why doesn't he intervene to protect, pre prevent her death? He's the emperor, after all. He could intervene if he wanted to, but why doesn't he? Number three, um, discuss the emperor's behavior and mental state in the aftermath of her death. How does the poet convey this? Right? I guess that's a pretty straightforward um, question. I think I divide it on the handout I gave you all. I think I divide the poem into four or five sections, and one of the sections is the aftermath of her death. And it focuses on him sort of recovering or sort of in emotional distress. Next question, how is the passage of, of, of time conveyed in the poem? Explain, citing specific passages. So again, uh, the poet uses indirect metaphoric language. So he doesn't say, um, and then next month this happened, then the following month this happened. He conveys the passage of time in different ways, using metaphors and whatnot. So explain how he does that. Number five, describe the Taoist priest and his special assignment. What supernatural powers does he possess? Right? And in order to answer this, you might want to look into uh, the sort of philosophy of Taoism, right? And um, see how the supernatural elements and uh, magic and whatnot are often um, in important elements in Taoism. Number six, where does, he, uh, where does the Taoist preach search? Where does he eventually find her? What is the significance of Peng Lai Mountain in the Sino-Japanese tr tradition? Right. So if you look at Japanese art too, from the Edo period, etc., you often see this mountain depicted. Right. Because a lot of uh, Edo uh, period literati artists wouldn't uh, depict uh, their own uh, mountains and landscapes and whatnot. I mean, they would, but they would often also pick depict um, depict. Yes, but anyways, moving on, Yang Guifei's condition and living quarters when the Taoist priest finds her. In what state is she in? It's a pretty straightforward question. The next question, what two keepsakes? The, in the Japanese translation of the poem, we have the word katami. What two keepsakes does courtesan Yang uh, Guifei give to the pr priest to take back with him? What message does she send for the emperor? Explain the significance of these. What secret pledge did they make years ago? And she alludes to this pledge in the very end of the poem. Uh, what do you think Bai Joey's point was in writing this poem? Right. So this is sort of a speculation question, a speculative question about his intent, the poet's intent. Does the poem contain a didactic purpose? Explain. As I mentioned in the beginning, Bai Joey is a very Buddhist uh, writer, very influenced by Buddhism. Do you see any sort of Buddhist messages, didactic messages, things he wanted to teach his uh, readers? If so, explain. And the final question, the legend of Yang Guifei appears repeatedly throughout Chinese and Japanese literary traditions from antiquity to present. Um, some of you may have read, uh, or at least read, excerpts of Murasaki Shikibu's uh, the Genji Monogatari. And the, very be the first chapter of uh, Genji Monogatari begins with uh, a discussion of this story. And um, you see elements of this story of Yang Guifei and the Emperor sort of repeated throughout Genji Monogatari, and they appear in Tanizaki's um, all the way through modern literature. Um, for example, I think last week we read Tanizaki's uh, Shise, the Tattooer. And I think if you look hard enough, you can find elements in the Tattooer of uh, this, this legend of Yang Guifei and, and uh, the Emperor. So... Um, and what it, well, I, I won't give too many hints about this question because I want you to th uh, think of this as we read uh, all of the various stories for this um, course. 
Okay, so those are the 10 questions that I want you to answer for your homework assignment. At the very end of the study guide, I give a list of works that at least appear to me to be influenced by this legend of Yang Guifei and the Emperor. And these include Yoki Hi Monogatari. There's an English translation available on the web for that. Genji Monogatari, as I just mentioned, the tale of Genji, especially chapter one. Wakang Ro E Shu, a classical work of Japanese poetry. Um, Konjaku Monogatari Shu, a classical work of um, from the late Heian period, I think, of Setsuwa, sort of anecdotal tales. Heike Monogatari drives from, draw, uh, draws from this story. Kara Monogatari dra, derives, draws from it. Tai Heike. And then into the modern period, we see stories by Sakaguchi Yango, and we'll read one of his stories later, probably this story, actually, in the forest under <coughs> cherries in full bloom. Um, draws from this story, in my view, Chijin no Ai, the great uh, story, novel Naomi by Tanizaki Junichiro, draws from this story again, uh, several works by Tanizaki. Mishima's uh, novel by Mishima also draws from this, and so forth. All right. That concludes this bumbling explanation of the study guide. If you have any questions, send them along and I'll make another video or answer your questions on um, Google Classroom. And I also record, last night I did a recording of this poem, the English translation of this poem, and uploaded that too. So if you want to read, listen to that as you read the English translation, feel free to do that. And again, I'm going to post uh, probably 15 or 16 um, stories or literary works over the course of this semester onto Google Classroom. You are required to choose six of those and to do the assignments for six of those. However, all of these works that I'm assigning are extremely important. So anybody who's really interested in the subject of Japanese literature really should read all of the, these and do the assignments or at least think of the answers to the um, questions that I put on the study guide. So I encourage you to do more than six, but um, six, at least six, are required. And at the very end of the semester, we'll probably have a short essay or a translation. I haven't uh, decided exactly what I want to do with that, so I'll talk about that more in the near future in a near video. And um, yes, bye-bye.